That's the Word of God, the Bible. And so when this was written, it was written to real people, and they were suffering under the Roman Empire. And much of the imagery you'll see uh, in the book of Revelation uh, really was probably referring to the Roman Empire, okay? And, but what Jesus was showing us is that when you keep Him at the center of your life, no matter what you go through, no matter what the difficulty is, He is with you, and he wins. Now, you may notice around you that there's not always justice in the world. Anybody ever notice that? Some people seem to get away with things that just are not right. There are things in our culture that we look at it and we say, that's just not right. Here's how you are encouraged from the book of Revelation. You're encouraged that Jesus will one day judge all evil governments, all false religion, all those that reject Jesus Christ. One day, all the sin of the world, Jesus will judge finally and will enter into heaven where God will pour out His grace and His love for all eternity. And so that can encourage you. No matter what you think about the book of Revelation, no matter how you interpret it, um, the fact is it points us to Jesus, and it points us to a time when God is going to be with us, living with us, dwelling with us. We will dwell with Him forever and ever, and He is going to pour out His grace and His mercy for all of eternity. There's not going to be any more crying, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. No more disease. That's something to be happy about. If you've lived beyond 13 years old, you know that our bodies are not getting better. They, they do for a while. You work out. You can bulk up, whatever. And for a while, it seems like you're not ever going to get old. I remember that feeling when I was a young man. I could do whatever. I ran a marathon one time, and uh, it was on a military base. And there was a young soldier that was standing right next to me, getting ready to run 26.2 miles. And he was obviously very young. He was probably around 21, 22 years old. And this tough, healthy young man, he had the world by the tail. He knew that he was never going to suffer physically. He knew that he was always going to be able to do whatever he wanted. Before the race started, you know what he was doing? He was smoking a cigarette, okay? How, how do you smoke a cigarette before you run a marathon, okay? I'll tell you how. When you're 20-something years old, all right, and you think you're invincible. But how many of you know the older you get, the, the worse it gets, okay? I mean, I'm at the point now, this Tuesday I'll be 58 years old, and I'm at the point now that whenever I bend over even, I think to myself, is there anything else that I can do while I'm down here so I don't have to do this again? And it's inevitable. But the good news is that Jesus wins, and we'll be able to be with Him forever. So let's read in Revelation 3, and we'll begin in verse number 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? Remember the angel is the pastor, and these are real churches that he's writing to, okay? So he's telling the John to give this message to the pastor so he can preach it to the church, okay? The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David. We're going to explain what that is. Who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will will open. How many of you know that God can open doors and God can shut doors? We're going to talk about what this means because it means maybe something different than what you think. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door. There's that door opening again, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. We're going to talk about that. What does it mean that you have but little power? You don't have the power that God has. You must rest in Him. You must trust in His grace, but you have some power. 
There's some people who say that I have no control over that. That's just the way I am. No, you have some power. You should rest in God's grace. You should trust in God's mercy. You should trust in the Holy Spirit of God. You should read the Word of God. Exercise spiritually. You have some control. You have some power, okay? Nothing compared to God. But he says, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he said, you're not super powerful, but you have kept this. I'm, I'm proud of you, he says. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. And once again, he's talking about people that denied that Jesus Christ was the way of salvation and not that uh, lost people are going to bow down at the feet of Christians. That's not what he's talking about. But he's showing that he is going to be vindicated. And it says uh, elsewhere in Scripture that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So one day we're going to see that played out, okay? And that's what he's talking about. He said, um, because you have kept my word about the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Let me just pause and say there are some people that interpret that to mean that uh, the church will be raptured out before the tribulation period of time. There's, that's a, called a dispensational uh, viewpoint on the book of Revelation, okay? But I do not believe, uh, and I'm not arguing about uh, that view, though I do not hold that view, um, but I'm, I'm saying that this part of the text means something different, okay? What he is talking about is that believers will not stand at the great white throne judgment, which is at the end of the book of Revelation. We'll read about that. So in other words, when you're a believer, you're not going to be tried like everyone else at the end of time. You're not going to stand. Are we going to stand before uh, the judgment seat of Christ? Yes, the Bible teaches that for believers will stand before a judgment seat of Christ, which will be about judging the quality of our works, okay? You're not going to be judged according to your sin. I can remember when I was a kid, uh, I read these tracts that showed this man that lived, and when he died, he stood before God, and before everybody in heaven, it showed a movie of his life and everything he ever did when he thought no one was looking, things that he was ashamed about. They played it on a big movie screen in heaven. And then for years, I thought that's what happened even to believers. Nothing could be further from the truth. Did you know that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you will not be judged for your sin. You'll be judged for your works. You will not be judged for your sin when you stand before God. Do you know why? Because God has already judged your sin on Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And the only possible way for you to enter into heaven is for God to look at you. You have been redeemed, paid for by Jesus Christ. You've been covered in his blood and washed clean from your sins. And when God looks at you, you have been justified, and he does not see your sin any longer. In fact, the Bible says, I will remember your sin sins no more. And that is how believers are going to be judged when we stand before God, not that God said, hey, I saw what you did when you were 21 years old on your 21st birthday when you thought nobody was watching. He's not, he's not going to judge you that way. Will we be judged for our works? Yes. But we are not going to be judged like non-believers. We will stand uh, before the judgment seat of Christ, which is different than the great white throne judgment. And for believers, Jesus is our advocate. He's our attorney. He is the one that has paid for our sins. He is the one that God poured out his wrath on. And when we stand before God, when it comes to the accuser, the devil, he is not going to be able to accuse you of the things that you actually did. You know why? Because Jesus has forgiven it. And so that's what he's talking about here, that you're not going to stand before that judgment. 
and that is good news for a believer. He says, I am coming soon. Um, hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this is the end of every address to every church, all seven of them. And the reason that he does this, he is saying, if you have spiritual ears, which you do, now you realize you don't literally have spiritual ears. That's a metaphor, right? That it's teaching that we have the ability to hear the, the Word of God. We have the ability to, to sense the Holy Spirit of God when he's speaking to you. And everybody here has had God speak to you before. Now, I'm not saying an audible voice. Maybe if you uh, hear the voice of God uh, and see a 900-foot Jesus standing uh, at the foot of your bed, that may be a legitimate vision from God. But maybe you ate too much pizza before you went to bed. Okay? That's all I'm saying. So what God wants us to understand here is that we have spiritual ears and we can hear what the Spirit of God says. What He's challenging us to do is this. When you hear, do something about it. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard God speaking to you? Once again, I'm not saying in an audible voice, though some people do hear that. That's fine. Have you ever felt the Holy Spirit leading you about a decision? You've heard the Word of God taught and you know that you need to make a decision about that and not done it. Anybody ever done that? Raise your hand. I have. I've, I've known that I should have done something, and I didn't do it. And then there have been times that I knew that God spoke to me, and I did it. And this is what he's saying, and he says it every time to the churches. I want you, when the Spirit of God speaks to you, and the Word of God speaks to you, do something about it immediately. That's what he's saying, okay? So what do we learn about the doors that Jesus opens himself? I just want to give you three thoughts, and we'll be done. And I believe that uh, these things are very, very helpful uh, for each of us about learning about how God opens doors. Here's the first thing. First thing about the doors that Jesus opens is this. Jesus saves. Now, when he talks about uh, opening a door that no one can shut and shutting a door that no one can open, he is talking about salvation. Let me show you this. He says there, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. This passage is talking about the big door that Jesus opens for every person to go through. Now, does every person go through it? No, they do not. But he makes it available for every person. What is that door? It's the door of salvation. He loves you. He died for you. And let me show you from Scripture what he's talking about here. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so he's talking about this door. In, in John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. So he's talking about this door that he opens, and I'm going to show you about the key of David in a moment, but he's talking about this door that he is the door. Okay, now understand that just because the Bible may use a metaphor about something does not mean it is not teaching a literal concrete truth. Okay? For example, when Jesus said, I am the door, is there anybody in here that thinks that Jesus is made out of wood and has a doorknob? No. Because even though that's a metaphor, it is a foundational truth to Christianity that Jesus is the way and the only way to be made right with God, to be saved, to become a Christian. Okay, so that's what Jesus is saying. And, and this is reflective 
on the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has so many scriptures that are also quoted in the New Testament, and they are about salvation. They're about the way to the Heavenly Father. Listen to Isaiah 22, verse 22. And I will place on his shoulder, talking about Jesus, the key of the house of David. Now, let me ask you a question. Who understands that when you use language like that, uh, that the, he's going to put it on his shoulder. Uh, we use that kind of terminology today. He has broad shoulders because he has a lot of responsibility, right? He has strong shoulders because he carries the weight of that business or the weight of that household or the weight of those decisions, okay? So that's very clear to us that what he's talking about, that he's talking about that Jesus has the responsibility of salvation. The key of David uh, is talking about the key to the house of Israel or to the way of salvation. So he says, I'm going to put it on his shoulder. It's his responsibility. He shall open and none shall shut. You ought to be thanking God that the Bible makes that statement. Because i got to be honest with you, there are many of us in this room, that, in fact, all of us in this room, if it was up to us to open the door, we'd be in trouble. If it was up to us to be righteous enough to be made right with God, we'd be in trouble. Every one of us would be in trouble. You know why? Because we fall short. And to be honest, there are some of us that probably fall a little more short than others, Okay. And, and, and the point is this, Jesus has this, this responsibility for salvation. He opens the door and no one can shut it. That, you know what that tells me? That no matter what you've done, Jesus can save you. Even though from a human perspective, people may look at your life and say, that person does not deserve salvation. And that's true, none of us do. But thank God, Jesus opens the door and nobody can shut it. And you should respond to that call to walk through that door. Then he says, and he shall shut and none shall open. Now, I believe this is speaking about the timing of our response. One day it will be too late. The moment you draw your last breath on this earth, you can no longer respond and go through that door of salvation. Now, the Bible does say that my spirit shall not always strive with a man. And he's talking about responding to the call of the Spirit of God to be saved. But I believe as long as you draw a breath, there's a chance for you. Jesus opens that door. Nobody can shut it. But then there comes a day when he shuts it, and nobody can open it. Be saved today. That's really the point. He has the power over salvation, judgment, death, and all truth, and he has the power over that door. Listen to Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. This is often quoted at Christmas time, but this is about salvation. Listen to it. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, the rule, the responsibility shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. If you haven't figured it out, he's talking about Jesus. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, I believe that Jesus is one that's able to counsel us and direct us and encourage us and advise us, but he's really talking about in his ability to rule, in his sovereignty. He is wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. Aren't you glad there is nothing too hard for God? There is nothing that is impossible with him. Thank God that Jesus has the opportunity, the ability, the power to open doors. Why? Because he is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He stands outside of time and space. And understand this, because he is eternal, he is separate from his creation. He is above it, greater than. He is not material. He is, God is spirit. Jesus became human, okay, entered humanity so that we could be saved. The only reason that he did that was because as a human, he could represent us. And as God, he could not die unless he became human. And he died on the cross, suffered God's punishment for our sin as a perfect human being, but also as God. So he paid the penalty for our sins. 
He shall be the prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Now listen, there's coming a day when all government is going to be good. Now I doubt that any of us can say that is true today. In fact, if you do say that, your wheel is spinning, but your hamster's dead. Okay, that's all I'm saying. You're, you're a slice of cheese short of a sandwich. Your elevator doesn't go to the top floor. You're a French fry short of a Happy Meal. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? No words, you're dumb. All right, in case you're wondering, okay, the, the point is that there is no perfect government now. In fact, there's a whole lot of imperfect government. But one day, one day, Jesus is going to rule. And the increase of his government is just going to get better and better and better and better for all eternity. And Jesus is going to pour out his grace on us, and it's going to get better. The longer we're in heaven, the more amazed we're going to be by it. The longer we're in heaven, the more amazed we're going to be by the heavenly Father and about Jesus Christ himself. The longer we're there, the more we're going to enjoy it. Now, that's, a, that's incredible to me, okay? Because, you know, for most of us, even things that we love, I mean, after a while, we get tired of it. You know what I'm saying? We want to take a break. I mean, I love chocolate, and I could eat lots of it, okay? But after I eat so much chocolate, you know what happens? I get sick of chocolate. I know that sounds like a sin, but I do. I'll get sick of it. I'm like, I'm so tired of this. I don't even want to see this anymore. No matter what you love, I'm assuming you love your kids, okay? And uh, there comes a time, though, after about 18 years of having to deal with them that you're like, oh, dear God, please let them move out of my house. Now, the good news is that in our culture that they often will leave, but 100% of the time they come back, all right? So, but the, the point is this. You love your kids. I know you love your kids. I love my kids. But after a while, you're like, give me a little space. Let me love you while you live over there, all right? But in heaven, do you know that you're not going to have that experience at all? It's just going to get better and that's what this is saying. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. It's just going to get better after you've been there a million years. You're going to go, I can't believe how good this is. And it's just better than it was a million years ago, even if we think about time when we're in heaven. And you're just going to be like, it just gets better and better, and I'm not sick of it. And guess what? You're not going to be sick of your neighbor in heaven either. You're just going to love them more and more, and you're just going to be like, man, you haven't bored me with those stories at all. And for all of eternity, I'm still interested. Please tell me more. And God knows, for those of you who have grandkids, we get tired of hearing those stories sometimes. Now, I don't have grandkids yet, okay? Maybe once, one day when I do, I'm going to bore you with stories too. But in heaven, it's just going to get better and better and better and better. He says he's going to uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And notice what he said, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The passion that God has, you know what that tells me? He has passion for you. He loves you. He, he does this because he has zeal for you. He wants to save you. He wants your life to be with him forever, forever. And ever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts does this. This open door refers to salvation. Jesus alone has that power. In the New Testament, Acts 14, 27. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened, notice, the door of faith to the Gentiles. So Jesus has that power to open the door, and no one else has it. Now, I realize I spent a lot of time on the, on the first point. The second two points are shorter, okay? Thank God. Here's the second point. First point is Jesus saves. That's what that door is. Second point is this. Jesus is sovereign. 
He said to that church, you have a little power. You know what that tells me? That Jesus is sovereign over the opportunities in our life. Don't ever be afraid to stand for your faith in business. You know why? Because God can open doors that you have no way to open. He can give you contacts that can only be explained either by chance, and I don't believe in that, or it was God. And so God has that power over opportunities in your life. And, and so this also applies to our witness. I, I say it this way. Uh, ask for divine appointments. Maybe God has you working where you are right now because there's a divine appointment that he wants you to take advantage of. Maybe it's a person that needs to hear your story about Jesus. Uh, maybe there's a door that will lead to an opportunity you never dreamed of in your life. But Jesus is sovereign over our opportunities. And by the way, I do believe that God speaks to us about things. I'm not suggesting that every decision you make, I think you should pray about every decision you make, but I'm not suggesting that every decision you make in life has the same impact, because it doesn't. I mean, if you're in line at a coffee place, and I shall not name the evil one that so many of you go to every day of your life, and you are deceived. The reason I call it evil is because it lies to you. It sells you on the idea that you're getting coffee. You're getting an 800-calorie milkshake is all you're getting, okay? And you can deceive yourself. I'm getting my morning coffee. Yeah, you're getting 800 calories of delicious dessert is what you're getting. But let's say that you're at unnamed coffee place, and uh, there are 30 people in the line behind you. And as happens every time you go to unnamed coffee place, that person that is at the front of the line is ordering the most weird thing and asking about every possible combination of things that don't even make up coffee. And they're asking for, like, uh, give me some yak milk uh, and uh, imported from Venezuela, and then I'll have, I'll have the sweetness of the pomegranate squeezed by hand and uh, I want you to march in the coffee beans uh, from around the world and roast them in front of me, and it takes you three days to get a freaking cup of coffee. I'm not bitter about it at all, all right? But if you are that person, make a decision before you get up there, okay? That's all I'm saying. But here's my point. That decision, you don't have to pray about it. I want a half-calf latte with foam and with otter milk, all right? I don't know what you get. Decide before you get. But the point is, it doesn't matter. That is, you don't have to pray about that decision. That's not a very big decision. But there are some things that God speaks to you about doing, and he's, it's a door that he opens, and you need to walk through it. When we started this church, that was an opportunity. I knew that God wanted us to do this, and God tested me. Uh, there were uh, a couple of opportunities that came my way after I'd already made the announcement that we were going to start this church. I'd already made the decision. That would have been a whole lot easier than starting a church. But the fact is, when God speaks to you, you do it. You go through that door. That's, that's what he's saying, okay? Jesus is sovereign over our opportunities. He's sovereign over our circumstances. He's sovereign over our problems. He's sovereign over time. He said, I am coming soon. And then finally, Jesus not only saves, he not only is sovereign, but Jesus strengthens. Verses 11 to 13, and I won't read them again, but in this, God gives us endurance. He gave this church endurance. He said, remember what you're going through, I will be with you. And I want you to understand that sometimes, sometimes life is difficult. Now, if you hear a preacher 
telling you that if you have enough faith and you hold your mouth just right, that you'll never have any problems. That everything financially in your life is going to be on the up and up. It's going to be going to the right and up all of your life. And if you'll give me $1,000 for my new jet, God's going to give you a million back, right? Okay. Let, let, me, let me just tell you, and, and I'm, not, I'm not mocking. There's some legitimate good Bible teachers. Um, but here's what I'm saying. Anybody that tells you that life never involves suffering is lying to you. Either they're trying to sell you something. Okay? Jesus never promised that we wouldn't have problems. He never promised that we wouldn't have trials. But you know what he did promise? That he would be with you. That he'll help you endure. He will help you get through it. He helps us by endurance. Then he helps us by empowerment. He will empower your witness and your walk. Interestingly, some of the churches that Jesus was talking to were extremely large. One church built a synagogue the size of a football field. That's huge. Probably tens of thousands of members. This church, however, was not very large at all. In fact, it was very small. He said, you have little power. But let me just wrap it up by saying this. When you give to God... What is in your hand, he will open a door and do what you cannot do. You say, well, I, I'm not very talented. Give it to God and see what he does. You say, well, I don't have a whole lot of money. Put God first and see what he does. You say, well, I don't have a whole lot of faith. Give that faith to God and see what he does in your life. We all know the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. And the interesting thing about that miracle, Jesus took five loaves and two fish, a typical Jewish lunch. And did he get this from the king? No. Did he find a rich person that had the resources to buy lunch for everybody? No. You know what he did? We don't even know the kid's name, but it was a little boy. And what he did is he gave his lunch to Jesus. And Jesus, in turn, took that and multiplied it and fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, and there were 12 baskets that remained. And I really do believe this. Whenever you give to God what you have, what is in your hand, he will multiply it. He will make it stronger. He will give you more opportunity than you ever believed. He will open doors for your life and little as much. When God is in it. So whatever it is you have, give it to him. Give it to him. Put it in his hand and see what God does. God will use you. The Bible is so full of stories about people that did just that. The little boy that gave his lunch to Jesus. Joseph was the, the second youngest of 12 brothers. And all he had was a vision. He didn't have much. And he was captured and put in prison for 13 years. But he gave what he had to God, and God elevated him to the second most powerful person in the world. And literally, not metaphorically, literally he saved the world from starvation. Whatever you have. When David was a young boy, he had a faith in God. And you know what he did? He got five little stones and he killed a giant. Little as much when God is in it. When you put what is in your hand into God's hand, he opens a door that no one can shut, and he shuts where no one can open. And my prayer for you today is simply this. Um, are you willing to walk through the open door? Maybe it's for salvation. Maybe it's for church membership. Maybe it's for getting involved in a small group or participating in some way or serving in some way. Maybe it's about giving. Maybe it's about worship. But whatever it is, God has opened a door for you. And he's saying, will you walk through it? Will you walk through it? And if you will, God will use you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have never made a mistake. We thank you that you have all power to open doors and to shut doors. 
Thank you for the greatest power, which is opening that door of salvation, that door of redemption, that door of forgiveness, that door of service, that door of growth. And God, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.